This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by my music staff. I think as I was teaching, if I could find a song that the student brought to me or that the student was interested in, I always felt like that song is going to bump them up a year's time because they're going to put love into that and they're going to put extra time into that. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day, everyone. Welcome back to another action packed episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 127. And a very special welcome to all my inner circle piano teaching community members. My name is Tim Topham, if you haven't met me before, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thanks a heap for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy the content. And of course, if you've been tuning in for a while, thank you also for choosing to spend more time with me. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is your place for inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. And of course, the best way to listen to these podcasts is via my piano teaching app. Just search for Tim Topham in your favorite app store. As always, today's show notes and a full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 127. Well, today's the day you get to meet my first ever celebrity guest, and he needs little introduction. My guest is an American pianist, composer, piano teacher, and author. Classically trained, he branched into New Age music in his 20s and has developed a classical crossover style that bends, uh, blends classical, contemporary, and rock and roll. Since 2010, he has been a member of the Piano Guys group, performing on their YouTube videos, albums, and in concert and often next to waterfalls or on top of cliffs. (laughs) In August 2016, they surpassed 1 billion views on their YouTube channel and now have well over 6 million subscribers. Welcome to the show, John Schmidt. Thank you very much, Tim. First up, I've got to ask you about the backgrounds on your YouTube videos where you're you know, playing a grand piano on the top of a cliff and then the next minute you're next to a waterfall and then you're in the Arctic Circle or somewhere. How do you do all this? Is this all just computer magic or are you actually there? <laughs> we're actually there. Um, we're kind of, uh, we're crazy. And uh, <laughs> Paul Anderson, one of the piano guys, owned a piano store had a bunch of pianos and uh, wanted to, uh, you know, plug his store and and do promo. And he'd always thought it would be cool to uh, make videos with pianos in the most random places imaginable. And, uh, you know, so we've got uh, four of the uh, seven wonders of the world. And uh, one time we lifted a piano literally with a helicopter on top of a thousand foot cliff. And uh, we have never green screened one of them. So, wow. Uh, wow. I, we used a green screen for uh, Cello Wars because we needed a Death Star. And that was just hard to come by the real Death Star. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. So you're actually <laughs> helicoptering these pianos into these places. I mean, that must, uh, um, that must either cost a fortune <laughs> or uh, be incredibly yeah, difficult. Actually, Paul has a friend that has helicopter connections. So oh, wow. Paul, Paul's got a lot of good friends. But we've only used a helicopter once. We've used a crane. Um, we've, but a lot of times we just like when we were in the desert, we put down wooden wooden uh, planks, and we would leapfrog the planks. Like we'd roll onto one and then uh, uh-huh. uh, move the one behind in front, and we leapfrogged for about two hours, and it was just like, you know, six of us. <laughs> oh my goodness! You're working up quite <laughs> so, a sweat, I bet. <laughs> yeah, especially in the early days, we were just kind of doing it for fun and on a bare bare bones budget. And right. we still try to keep a bare bones budget because we all have families, and we we'd rather have the money go to to our kids. So. Mm. And you must have to so, have the piano tuned as well once it's in these positions, I assume. Well, the thing that's interesting about uh, making piano videos is uh, if you were to use live sound, it would be horrible. It would be wind noise. It would be cars passing, airplanes flying over. So, so the way it works is you play to a track and um, you're actually playing, you're actually performing. 
and there's a real, you know, a real definite click so that you can be right together with the recorded version. And then when you're done, they just drop in that recorded version. Oh, so, and right. that's how that's how everybody makes music videos. Right. And someone was going to uh, had asked me to ask you about that one of my one of our listeners how how you get the audio and video and everything looking and sounding so good. So that's the yeah. actual trick behind it. Yeah, and you have to practice very very uh I don't know. You have to put a lot of time into the practice to get it all to to match up, and you have to literally get all the p- keystrokes identical to how you recorded it, which which is a lot of work. I was gonna say, but that I would think be hard. it's it's really important for me when when I'm playing to have the keystrokes, you know, be what pianists would notice if if you're not playing it the same. Yeah. So I, I try to play it stroke for stroke, exactly the same as the recording. Mm. Well, um, moving on, how does it uh, feel to be an inspiration to students and teachers all around the world now? Um, yeah, it's, I, I just, it's unbelievable. I, I can't really, you know, it hasn't really sunk in to tell you the truth, but every once in a while we get a, we get, um, a sense of it, you know, the comments that are left on the, on the videos and, uh, we have, um, we have over we have 1.5 billion views now and those views often have comments that people leave and many of those have been from pianists and from teachers and from parents you know saying thanks for thanks for helping my kid not quit All right um, you know it it's lit, lit him on fire or they come to a concert and and we get an email or a comment that says and they, you know, they've been practicing every, every, ever since we went to your show. And it's, uh, it's really cool. I mean, because my inspiration was Billy Joel as a teenager, um, along with all of the masters, you know, that I was, that I was working with that, that, are, that are all dead, unfortunately. But Billy Joel was one that was still alive. Mm. And, and I could watch him. And, and literally, I owe a lot to his inspiration. Um, Really, yeah. really great, grateful that perhaps I could play that role for somebody else. I think, yeah, for me, Billy Joel, Elton John, of course, was another one for me too. But I can yeah. still, I've still got the song books I was given as children, uh, as a child, I should say. And uh, yeah, they have, yeah, they have a huge impact. Uh, and um, yeah. I, I must pass on that uh, I saw one of my adult students yesterday who's come back to piano more recently, and she said that it was actually one of your videos. It was one of your mashups. You did a One Direction oh. song, she said. And that's cool. what got her back into it. So there you go, real oh, personal that's really connection. Cool. Now I gather you oh, had great um, to hear. <laughs> I gather you had quite a musical family growing up, and your sister actually taught you piano. Is that right? Yeah, we. Uh, my parents are German immigrants and uh, grew up on classical music. And uh, my sister, who is eleven years older than me, she studied classical uh, in you know on the college level. She was accepted into a master's program master's performance program as a freshman so she just she had major chops right and uh so i i got a really nice classical private uh instruction from her um mm. and she she had studied with some really wonderful teachers um growing up she's the best best pianist in the family and i've got i've got big respect for classical artists just, right just huge respect i i really feel like it's the classical players that uh, that uh, have the the highest skill level, mm. and uh, so r- a lot of respect. Yeah, well, I, and I had a classical upbringing as well, and I have to say that if if I want to practice and get my chops up, the first thing I'll go to <laughs> is some Chopin or you know Absolutely. something hard. I mean, that's they're they're shredders. Those uh, they're superhuman. You know, you watch <laughs> Yu Jia Wang play Flight of the Bumblebee faster in octaves than most people can play with one <laughs> hand and it's just like wow yeah you know you just bow so it's it's really really cool so your original piano lessons were sounded they're all quite traditional did your sister mm-hmm. work with you on any contemporary any chord pop anything like that or was it really quite classical yeah it was very classical and i picked up all of all of the other stuff on my own as a teacher, I started teaching when I was about 16 and uh, taught for about 25 years. And uh, I incorporated uh, quite a bit of the, the stuff that I learned chord wise with students, especially. I think that, you know, classical is the highest skill level. So I think the ideal 
is to try to get to the classical route if you want to get as good as possible at the piano. But there are so many students I found that didn't enjoy classical music enough that I, I had to depart from that route. And then the question came to my mind, is it better to try to push them to the ideal in classical and risk them quitting? Or would it be more ideal to try to be creative and to branch off into chord methods and, um, you know, whatever. I, I felt sort of like I was a, a doctor d trying to diagnose what the best um, uh, remedy would be. And I found in, in many cases um, that that saved my students, that that mentality. And but but at first I was really classical because that's what I knew. That's what I grew up on you know, the scale exercises and, and the classical composers. And it was a really good thing for me to branch out uh, with, with students. And I felt like it, this is way better than having them quit. Right, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure there's so, teachers all around listening to this, nodding their heads going, yes, I feel like a doctor diagnosing every <laughs> student that comes in. And just when you feel that they're working really well, uh, they'll suddenly just, they'll suddenly start falling off the yeah. the practice and then you're analyzing them again and you're diagnosing. So I think that's actually absolutely. a great and, analogy. And some students loved the classical. That's what they really just dialed into. Mm. And uh, I, I would have to say that I was one of those. I, I right. really loved the classical. So I was one that loved two things. So yeah, it was interesting. I, I don't think I would have quit if I just did classical, but it was really nice for me to s discover those other aspects. Those, like you say, the creative aspects. Right. So I'm going to come back to a little bit of how you teach in a moment. But um, when, when you were younger, I think you were performing as a soloist. Uh, well, this is well before the piano guys. Um, and were you yeah. doing, was that classical performance or was that a mix? I was uh, just my compositions. I'm, uh, right. you know, I started composing music as, a, as like when I was 11. Uh, I wasn't very good at, at first, but uh, I think I came up with some really good stuff in my teen years. And uh, I've got a song called Waterfall, for example, that I wrote uh, when I was 17. And uh, I'm really happy to see that that song has kind of, um, you know, infiltrated into a lot of piano teaching um, you know, a lot of students are, are, you know, having that that piece that they're learning. Yeah, that's a um, that's a huge. A uh, lot of fans of that piece. I actually had yeah, someone it's ask. Just exciting. Yeah, I had someone ask, uh, what was the inspiration for that one? You know, it's it's interesting. I was I was studying my classical. A lot of times, ideas would come after I, you know, like the second hour into working on my Bach or my Mozart or whatever, and I was working on a Bach jig. Yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah. You know, this this one that's just so cool. And I, I loved it so much. I love the feel of it. <clears throat> I did play it without that E flat, just so you know. But, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but um, I just love the feel of it. And after I had worked on it for like an hour or two one day, it just gave birth to, you know. You know, I wanted to make up something with that same meter and that same feel. And uh, it was just cool. It just came. It just hit. And then as I was working on the B theme and so forth, that, that took a little longer. Altogether, it took about six months for me to write Waterfall. Wow. Wow. Oh. And, and after only five or so years of, teach, of uh, composing too at this stage, and it's now one of, yeah. the, one of your top, you know, the ones that everyone knows. I know. It's yeah. just really fun. Yeah. And All of Me was another big tune that came like two or three, three years later. So, it's, so I had some tunes uh, that I had written. And I started performing them when I was in my early 20s. It was like, I think I was 22 when I did my first um, concert. And right. uh, it was just like 200 people there to, to raise some money for the, for the high school that I went to for their choir trip. Yeah. So. Well, and uh, by hearing uh, Waterfall too, I immediately thought of all of me. Uh, and I, I was lucky enough to be putting together the Australian Music Exam Board's last series of books over here, and I included yours at uh, our grade eight level, all of me, oh, um, which is nice. a, a great piece. But of course, uh, as I've been uh, touring around and showing teachers the new pieces, I've been having to actually keep that one current, and it's uh, that takes a bit of practice. I tell you what, oh, okay. <laughs> that's great. Thank it's you. It's good. It's good. <laughs> um, so let's go on to your teaching. You, you said you've done you. We're a teacher for around 25 years. What what yeah. styles 
I mean, I've gathered you've said, you know, you, you taught a bit of classical and a bit of modern. Did you have a preference as a teacher now, not just as a student, as a teacher of which um, style you were teaching? You know, my, my preference was what I had been taught growing up, which was classical. That's mm-hmm. what I leaned toward. Um, so I kind of had to figure out um, other methods by myself. And, and that, that I, I would prefer, you know, other methods to having people quit for sure. But one thing I really struggled with was with beginners and teaching note reading. Mm. Just struggled. I, I was losing so many, so many beginners t- teaching them the method that I had been taught, which was every good boy does fine and F A C E. And I just, when I was six years old, and I actually had an, a different teacher uh, for for about a year or so while my sister was at college. So it was just it wasn't sinking in, and I just I went into denial, and I started reading the finger numbers. Oh, and right. after a year, after a year. The, the key changed out of the key of C to the key of G. And all of a sudden, my teacher was mad at me. And I had no clue oh. <laughs> what was going on. So, um, but that was my experience learning notes. And so as I tried to teach people that same method, I was just like, it really didn't work for me. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why am I trying it with anyone else? And, and, that, and then I was losing students with, with that method. And so I thought, you know what, I... I'm now married and have a have a child and I've got to pay the bills and I can't have all of these beginners quitting on me because note reading is so hard. So I discovered, I, I asked myself the question. I said, I wonder if I could just channel all that beginning enthusiasm right to note reading, just like you would in a type class where you just input 20 minutes a day for two months. I wonder what would happen. And I tried some experimenting and I found that if if I did that after about two months, it became something that became kind of automatic because we'd done it 20 minutes a day. Right. And uh, then I built a whole method on it. I built a whole note reading method on that. And it, and it works awesome. I've got really great feedback from it. So this is your 67 fun songs. Is that right? Yes. Yep. The me- yeah. All of the method, uh, like what, what to do each lesson is in the first part of that book. Right. Um, or I think it's moved to the last part of the book in the last printing. But, you know, week by week for eight, 10 weeks or something like that, it tells tells teachers what to do. Or if somebody's trying to do it, you know, do it yourself, it tells you what to do. And um, it's just like the shortest route right. from seeing a dot and pushing the right key and not being not using any um, scary terminology that would be intimidating at all. Right. So, so I'm I'm assuming this is so I would call the every good boy does find a mnemonic approach, whereas yeah. I'm assuming yours is more a landmark note approach. So students yes, just instantly absolutely. recognize bang bang bang, and then they absolutely. read intervallically. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, because it took, it cuts down the cognitive steps from oh, 100%. Like four to two. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They're not having to yeah. think what's the rhyme. Uh, what is the letter they're getting to? What <laughs> is that? Yeah, I mean, it's so complex, <laughs> isn't it? It's amazing that any yeah. of us learned that way. I it's, think. <laughs> I I wonder, just geniuses. I think I I wasn't one. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, um, as you've mentioned, I, I I'm a passionate believer in the power of exposing students to chords and progressions from a really early age, and particularly using mm. pop as a context because. Uh, I find that students can really relate to that. And if they can make those connections between music that they're learning, which could be classical or contemporary, and the music they're listening to, they're more likely to get it. Um, things like the 12-bar you know, blues and that sort of stuff. Yeah. When I when I had a students that were struggling, I would totally ask them, what is your favorite song? I would show them the chords and, you know, we would we would play it, you know, because they had heard it. And that's actually taught me so much is to to pick songs that I really loved and try to learn them by ear. Mm. Because what it taught me to do is it taught me to analyze it in a way that is much deeper than when you're just reading dots on a page. Um, I, I, I gained an understanding and that's, that taught me everything I needed to know about uh, composing. And I would really encourage teachers to... Um, you know, give that challenge to their kids. If there's a tune that they really enjoy, to learn at least uh, 30 seconds of it by ear. Um, and if that's too hard, then just 
try to pick out the bass part by ear, the lowest notes they hear. And then if that's too hard, I would have my students pick out, or, or after they got the lowest ones, then I would have my students pick out the highest notes they heard or the melody. You know, once they have the lo lowest and the highest for, for a 30 second little spot, I would say, now, you know, go back and, and try these six chords. There's, there's six chords that probably fit you know, in between the low and the high, you know, and I teach them the one and the two and the three and the four and the five and the six. And it was just, it was so sensible for them. I, I can't believe so. how alike our teaching is. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so when I've, I, I present at workshops for teachers and things, and one of my topics is I call four chord composing, which is pretty much exactly that about showing yeah. kids that really in each key there's only six chords that really are used for 90% of particularly popular True. music. Um, so let's teach the kids about that so that they can put it yeah. into context when they're playing and listening. Right. They don't need the two very much, so you can leave that out. Yep. So you just go one, four, five and throw the six in, you're good to go. You don't need the three very much. Exactly. You've got yeah, uh, you know, 90% of pop music. One, four, five and six, you're, you're good to go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, it's really great to hear. And also that idea of listening and singing bass lines and trying to pick that out, I think is just yeah. such a crucial skill. Um, I don't yeah. know about you, but I find kids really, they find it very difficult, uh, particularly if they're not brought up with that over a long period of time with simple things first. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I tend to be able to hear it, I think, because I've sung in choirs at the bass part. Uh, mm -hmm. And I like, I kind of naturally hum bass lines. But did you find Same it difficult here. for kids to often hear that? And they'll much more easily sing the melody, obviously. Yeah, I think maybe that that's a better place to start is pick out the highest notes you hear, you know, and then once you've done that, then pick out the lowest notes you hear. And I would always tell them if you if a note that you play doesn't sound right, that's a really good sign <laughs> because some people can't they can't tell when they play the, you know they can't tell when they go you know you know the, they don't they don't sense anything wrong with that because their ear's not good enough, you know? So you always say, you know, if you're struggling because it sounds wrong, that's a really good sign. That means that you sense when it's wrong, and that's half the battle, is sensing when, when, you, when you got it wrong. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, My Music Staff. My Music Staff is the most popular studio management software available to music teachers around the world. I've even written a blog post on how I personally used My Music Staff to transition to automatic monthly payments. All of my students now receive an automatic invoice each month and their credit cards are charged instantly. My Music Staff has become an essential part of my own studio and I've effectively been able to put my entire teaching business on autopilot. One of the great things about My Music Staff is that it scales with your studio. When you start growing your business, it doesn't mean more work for you. From student management to scheduling and billing, it offers you everything you need to manage your business with ease. There's even a student portal that allows students to notify you of any upcoming absences and even reschedule missed lessons without needing your input. It's a great solution for any teacher looking to improve their business and set themselves apart from their competition. Head to mymusicstaff.com to start your 30-day free trial today. Well, look, let's talk a little bit more about the piano guys then. Uh, and I'd just love to know mm. how it all came about. I think you, you mentioned before that the piano guys was actually the name of your local piano store. Is that right? Well, Paul, who I talked about, who had the piano store with all the pianos, um, was, a, was a good friend. Um, and uh, when I would perform in St. George, Utah, he would always supply the, the, the piano. And then I got to know him that way. And then he would invite me to his store to do events for piano teachers i would do workshops with note reading and, and all that stuff and and also songwriting and so i got to know him really well and we put out a video um that kind of went viral it was love story by taylor swift meets uh, viva la vida by coldplay oh, yeah. and it and it went viral and paul saw that and and the wheels got turning he's like you know i would love to uh do some piano, we put pianos in, in really cool locations. And he asked me to kind of do a favor for him, you know, and come down and play some of my compositions on these pianos that he would put it, like in the, in the Canyon or whatever. And we did two or three tunes um, of my original compositions. And he wanted to put them on this channel on this YouTube channel um, called the piano guys. That was the name of his store. And to see if he could use that as marketing to to do a little better than newspaper and radio, 
And so it just kind of helped <laughs> him with that. I think that happened. <laughs> yeah, and it, it did. And, and in fact, uh, so uh, and then it kind of took off a little bit. Uh, and then we're like, let's, let's try to do, let's try to pull out all the stops. And we got Stephen Sharp Nelson involved, who I had been collaborating with. And he is an amazing cellist, very innovative. And he also played with me on Love Story Meets Viva La Vida, that first one. He was playing cello and kick drum simultaneously. <laughs> oh, wow. And I think people <laughs> thought it was really unusual and cool. So he had just gotten a brand new electric cello. And we decided, let's see how many sounds this electric cello can make. Uh -huh. And we, we just tried. And we came up with 50 invented textures on that electric cello. And we tried to use them all in this song called Michael Meets Mozart. And then we got a fan base that uh, that had been built up over the years to to share it, and it just went viral again. And, wow! Uh, at that point, it was too late to change the name because we thought we'd love we'd love to do this now with a pianist and our cellist Stephen Sharp Nelson, but we don't want him to be known as a piano guy. That's just uh, so yeah. so horrible right <laughs> for a cellist. But yeah. <laughs> we, but we found that you can't change a YouTube name without use, losing your views. And we had racked up like millions of views at that point. And we, mm. we felt like we just, you know, we've got it. We just got to go with this name. So how's Steve so coping now? It's, it's, I know. Poor Steve. <laughs> we we try. He, he's in therapy, but he's doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys are quite well known for mashing up uh, old and new works when you perform. So I think you've mashed up the Canon in D. Uh, you've mucked around with Swedish House Mafias. Don't you worry, child. I used to love Swedish House Mafia when they were uh, really popular a few years back. Uh, and more recently, yeah. film scores like Jurassic Park. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm interested to know, what, what's your process for creating those arrangements and choosing the song you might pull apart? Yeah. You know what? We, we, we all love classical uh, but we also love any good music, whatever age it's from. And uh, at that point, we just kind of we survey we survey the landscape, and uh, we, we're we're ready to use whatever in whatever combination. It's sort of in my mind, it's sort of like cooking. Um, and one of our favorite spices, two of our favorite spices, are pop and classical. And we're just not afraid to use them together. And they, they sound really great together. Like if we're going to arrange a pop tune, we love to put a lot of classical spice in there. And mm. sometimes literally, you know, classical music is full of hooks. Like right. if you did a highlight reel, if you did a highlight reel of classical <laughs> music, it would be so cool to watch, you know, <laughs> if there was any way to get it all in one place. So we try to take those little highlights and we it will we'll literally use them and combine them with uh, popular things and vice versa. If we want to, if we want to arrange a classical piece, then we'll, we'll use some pop spice, right. you know, and, and use, use both of them simultaneously. And of course, this is incredibly controversial, John, um, <laughs> because, <laughs> cause there are a lot of people who really worry or, or feel that classical, you know, shouldn't be mucked around with. Um, and I actually, had I a, agree. A, and I, I've, I've come across that. We've come across that a lot. Right. And well, look, we I, actually have, <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I had a, a, a listener comment saying, um, what does he think? What does John think about mixing classical pieces with other music? Isn't it an act of violation? <laughs> Doesn't he think <laughs> that it can change our perception of the original piece forever? <laughs> you know, and and I I saw that comment, and I and I gave it a lot of thought, and and I had and I it's, it's things that I've thought over the years. One thing that comes to mind is I know that Beethoven would uh, take and cover and do twelve variations on. Um, Handel or Mozart and Brahms would do 12 variations on uh, Schumann or whoever. And so even the, even the greats were, were covering and, and trying their spin on things. Right. And, uh, and I think a lot of people have often wondered, well, I wonder if, if Beethoven and Mozart and Bach had the technology that we have today and were familiar with the, innovations that have occurred in music if they would have what they would have done with that and i'll bet they would have just they would have incorporated it in, is my opinion yeah and i think you know in in you you might say that it's uh tarnishing the original but um 
there probably is an element. There, there's probably pluses and minuses, you know, there, and there probably is that minus. But I think there's more pluses because I think it also introduces those originals to people that never would have found it, which I think is very valuable. A lot of times on our videos, we'll say, we'll put a link to say, you know, we've, we've been inspired on this piece by Beethoven, uh, you know, Fifth Symphony. And then we'll put a link to a performance on YouTube. And then if you go to that link and click on it, several of the co top comments say the piano guys brought me here you mm, know and people mm. people have discovered a new work of art right. and i have to say also just one more thing on that all of me has been <laughs> totally covered and changed like one guy a guy named jason black did a version of all of me in the minor key and called it none of me <laughs> and it's just so cool i mean it's just so cool and it's so inspirational it's such a compliment to me when I see that another person did a banjo cover and I've seen drum covers and I, I saw somebody do a full on instrumental um, redo of it. And it was just so flattering to me. And I just I'm thinking if if it could spark somebody's imagination, I am complimented. And I hope that Beethoven and Bach and Mozart might feel the same, <laughs> that, it, that it would be a compliment, you know. And of course, nowadays, everybody just covers one another you know right. that's just just something that 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 we do mm. so yeah i i know i hope hopefully could could resolve that concern for a lot of the classical purists yeah that 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 i know that 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 is that is disturbing to them that somebody would put their own spin on on moonlight sonata mm. uh but uh and what's I your know. yeah what, what's your take on the traditional uh stuffy in air quote, quotes um classical recitals uh do you, do you feel you know where where it's all tales and people aren't sure when they're allowed to clap or not and all that kind of stuff um do yeah. you think there's a, a life for those still in the future or is it people like you uh and some of these more modern composers who might be taking elements of that uh, you're still playing traditional instruments on a stage mm. but there's something different yeah. about it that will keep that kind of recital going I hope that what we do will enhance what what they will increase the interest in the um, I just feel like I respect it so much. I respect when somebody comes out and plays Beethoven's Emperor Concerto, you know, flawlessly. And I just I just feel like there's a spirituality about that music that is. Um, I think it's appropriate that. Um, that we treat it with, with the respect that it that is treated with. You know, I, I don't I don't know if it would be appropriate to hoop and holler in the middle of when somebody nails a lick on, on <laughs> Emperor Emperor's Concerto. It's like, Woo! yeah. You know? I think I think I think we need to give each other a chance to just really sink into this because because I think the inspiration, and that's the other thing that I as a composer I feel like the inspiration doesn't originate with me. And so therefore, hopefully I, I would think that I, I know Bach, for example, felt that way, that the inspiration didn't originate with him. And so if somebody takes that inspiration and, you know, puts their own interpretation on it. But my point is, is that it's inspiration. And mm. um, I think they were those those composers were really dialed into it. Mm. Yep. And I think it needs to be respected. It's a different sort of, I mean, I mean, jazz is inspiration too, but it's just, a, it's a different flavor. I don't know. It's a, it, there's a more spiritual flavor. There's a more fun flavor. There's a more, uh, I, I'm rambling a little no, no. bit. But... I, I guess my, my question was probably, it might've been a bit poorly worded. It was more um, related to whether, whether you feel that there is still going to be in 10, 20 years time audiences for classical recitals uh, and the performers that are needed to to create them, or do we really have to start looking at things like you guys are doing that 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 appeals to a wider audience? Yeah, I, I it's not fair that what we do appeals to a much wider audience. It's just something we have to acknowledge. Um, Why well, isn't it fair? But I I would do I would do everything I could to give the widest possible audience to those that deserve it so much more than we do from a talent perspective, from a practice perspective, I guess the only thing they don't do is write their own stuff. And that's, that's why we can't practice this because we're writing, mm. you know, so that, that, that's the trade, but their skill level, it's, 
it's like Princess Bride when the guy just devotes his life to sword fighting. And it's just like, I would rather, you know, I wouldn't, what is, what is the line where he's like, I would, I would sooner break this stained glass work of art than kill you. And he just knocks him out. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, it's just like, they're so, they're so amazing. They're superhuman. And I just, I never want it to die. I never want the, uh, the classical genre to die in the classical stage and the, um, you know, concerts. It's, uh, I think it, they would do well to, to try to, to have, to pick more of the classical music that is more accessible and to maybe steer a little bit more away from the stuff that's so esoteric. I right. think that would be a good call for them. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, because there's very few people that enjoy that esoteric yeah. stuff. It's <laughs> usually usually just the elites. Right, right. I, <laughs> I once made the uh, mistake of going to an all atonal <laughs> music recital, yeah. and I, I, that that was a mistake I will not make again. I don't. <laughs> I know if I mind if that part dies. Right. I don't know <laughs> if I mind, okay. and I think it might help the light life of classical music if it did die. <laughs> I just. <laughs> Let the people that like it, like it, and let them get together in their living rooms, because that's about how many people you have. <laughs> but don't force it upon everybody else for elitism, you know? That, that's yeah. my opinion. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I'm, I'm really keen to talk about your upcoming tour in just a moment, but I did have a couple of quick listener questions. Um, firstly, uh, they are, someone asked, will you be printing the music to your Jurassic Park uh, arrangement? I, you know, I, I think we didn't get the, the print rights right. to, to publish the sheet music on that. I think we're still working on that. Okay. So it might be in the future. Yeah. I know how long uh, copyright approvals take to get. It's, <laughs> it's quite yeah. a job. Um, <laughs> someone else asked about your practice. Can you give us a really quick overview? Do you still do scales? Do you play some mm. classical before you practice your own stuff? I have to do, uh, I have to do a Hannon uh, uh, regimen at least three times a week if I want to be able to play anything uh, fast. Uh, right. I just, I need my fingers to be strong to play. Some of the stuff we do is, you know, pretty fast mm. and challenging. So and uh, the, 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 fingers, the first few the fingers Hannons? need to be in shape. I've, I've kind of developed, I've kind of developed some Hannons that work all the fingers, you know, the, the couples and then the, the weak ones and then the, I've got like four different exercises that I do in, in a row that just keep the fingers in shape. Right. Keep them strong. Yep. The minute they get weak, my playing just goes to pot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, care, I care about my audience way too much, so I, just, I keep them strong. That's great. And um, what advice would you give to young music students, particularly teenagers who want to explore like, their creativity? Uh, and uh, a similar question from someone else saying, any advice for pianists who are just starting to improvise? Um, you know, a really cool bit of advice that I heard given uh, from a jazz artist um, said that every time he heard something cool, like a solo, he would learn it note for note. Um, and I would really recommend that. And I heard a guitarist go one step further on that. He said he would learn it note for note in every key <laughs> oh my goodness so, what that yeah would take that forever. guy was a shredder he was one of the best guitarists in utah uh <laughs> this is the state where i'm from he was just he was like a studio guitarist and he was just like he was amazing and that that like that, that like for me really turned my turn it, it really just it made me realize that if somebody wants to get good at something, they've got to be obsessed. It's got to be a love, and it's got to be similar to when a kid gets a, a new video game that they've wanted for a long time, and they finally get it. They're going to spend not 10 minutes a day, but hours a day playing that video game, trying to find all of the levels, trying to, to, to research it. And music can become that way. And really anything can become that way. Um, you can gain a love for it, which can lead to an obsession. And I'm talking about obsession in a good way. Mm. And that always my advice to kids is you've got to get obsessed with it on some level in some way. Uh, and, and that always leads to a lot of time, putting a lot of time in. Yeah. 
and that's the challenge for us as teachers is inspiring mm. kids enough that they become obsessed in a good way, as you say. It's one of the Where hardest things. You, you, would, you would never impose that sort of time on a student. But as a teacher, I think you hope that you can plant the seed or give the spark that they will do it on their own. Mm. But, but I do believe that until a student gets to that point of obsession because of love, that they won't ever get really satisfied and become really incredible at, at their art, whether it be piano or dance or sports or whatever it is. It's, it's, uh, I saw my kids do the same thing with basketball, put mm. that sort of obsession into their shooting practice and their, uh, whatever, you know? And I, I think it's, uh, it's when that, that, when that amount of time, when your daily practice changes from 20 minutes to like several hours, that's when you that's, see progress. You go bang, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, it's been so great to speak with you uh, today, John. And I'm oh, I am awesome personally to speak with you. I'm personally so excited about your Australian tour, which people might not oh, know we about. Are so this so could excited. be the announcement. <laughs> we are so excited. This we have been trying trip. to get to Australia. Yeah, we've been trying to get there for so long. And we've got so many wonderful fans down there. We've got, there's ways you can kind of sense it yeah. on social media, oh, oh. As, uh, where people are from and how, in, how intensely they, they enjoy your, your stuff you're putting out. And we get, a, we get, it's pinging off the charts in Australia and it's just been hard to get down there. So we're, we're really excited. Oh, that's great. Well, so oh. your tour is starting in Brisbane on the 28th of September and then you're heading over to Perth on Saturday, the 29th of September, Sydney on Monday, the 1st of October and finishing in Melbourne on Tuesday, the 2nd of October. You are going to have a busy, busy time there. Uh, what can fans yeah. expect at this concert? Uh, we're going to pull out our very best. It's all of the lollipops. All the we're all the hits we've been very, talking about. Very best show. As as we as we look past our in our uh, past seven years, um, you know, we're going to say what what is the very best show that we can put together for that tour. So we're just so excited to get there. Fantastic! And there'll be obviously solos. There'll be you working with Steve. There'll be a whole mix of yeah. things. Will the and uh, piano video, be video op- elements? Oh, great! Will the What's piano that? be opened up and seven of you inside a piano plucking strings? Yeah. We'll yeah. throw that in there too. It's definitely <laughs> excellent. Definitely. I can still it's, picture it's that. It's really video. a cool. It's really a cool variety show. It, 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 one of the fun things for me to go do is to go on to Ticketmaster and read the reviews, and it's just it's just awesome, mm. you know. And and I've I've compared it with other acts and so forth. You, you're always going to get your negative reviews. Every uh, there's not one act that doesn't get that, you know. But uh, we get so few compared to other acts. And the thing that's really fun to watch and, and to look at is, is uh, you know, what, how people describe their experience at the show. And, and so many people say it was better than the videos and more <laughs> well, entertaining. And, and we came away just like totally surprised. And it's, it's just it's fun to fun to hear that. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, so for people interested in booking, uh, heading, need to head to thepianoguys.com slash tour. And of course, the, all the information's on thepianoguys.com. Uh, and we should mention too, John, that your books are available on Amazon, I'm pretty sure, your 67 fun uh, songs, which is your introductory method. Yeah, and it, also at pianoguys.com might be the, the more sure way of, of getting that. And I'm, I'm about to put that out into a video, video form. Oh, great. This whole note, this whole note reading, that just taking the, the mystery out of those dots and lines, and you know, just uh, turning it more into a, a type approach where I I give people twenty minutes a day of stuff, and I and I help them daily, um, you know, with with what's going on, and and it's just a, sort of a note reading for dummies thing that I, that I'm doing, and and I think you know, if piano teachers even wanted to use that to give their students a really great note reading foundation before and and have that be like a prelude to what you do as a teacher but you know now you you're starting a kid and they're really good at reading notes and then you just go from there and do what you normally do so. right well let me know when it comes out and i'll uh, do my best to uh, spread the word for you thank you and last question uh if we as teachers in our studios are trying to encourage and um inspire more john schmitz to come through in our students <laughs> What would you say the one thing, or one or two things we should be doing is? Yeah, I, I think uh, classical, you know, if, if, as much as possible, as much as some kids will tolerate more than others. Mm. 
you know, and then and then well-rounded, you know, just uh, encourage them to do the things that we've talked about to try try their hand at playing something by ear and you know every time they learn something by ear you get better your ear improves and you get better at it when i first tried to learn a song it took me four months and you know i got to the point where sometimes i could listen to a song once or twice and just play it Mm. but that that took a, a process of refining refining the ear and um but those those simple things. Learn this thirty second spot. Doesn't need to be a whole song. Learn, you know, don't you don't need to feel like you got all the chords and the, all the notes in between the melody and the bass. Um, yeah. You know, teach them a little bit about it. Just challenge them and find their fun. Find what what is fun for them. I would I would say that's powerful. I I think as I was teaching, if I could find a song that the student brought to me or that the student was interested. And I always felt like that song is going to bump them up a year's time because they're going to put love into that and they're going to put extra time into that. Um, so I think that's a big advantage. Um, mm. And maybe maybe just give yourself permission to not, you know, be so rigid. That's what I would say as a teacher, you know. Yep. So uh, That's a great summary. And I should have asked too, you're in your studio. Are you recording uh, a new album at the moment? Or preparing we're working for the on, tour. We're working on a uh, an arrangement of uh, uh, th- a million dreams from the uh, Greatest Showman. Oh, and, uh, I just and saw I'm that to, last weekend. Amazing. Yeah. And I, I just I really was inspired by that song uh, as far as making a, a, a an arrangement that works. Just if you have a pianist and you don't have a cellist handy, you just want to <laughs> play this arrangement with just a piano. So I'm I'm really excited. There will be some cello textures as well. But it will be an arrangement that will be, uh, you know, you'll be able to play it totally solo piano. Uh, and it's coming together really cool because there was the question of should I go big with this or should I go mellow with this? And and it, it just felt like it. Uh, the message of the song is a million dreams, you know, and it's just really grandiose and big and. So it's oh, fun. I'm going to look out for that really one. That, that's, that's great. We'll look out for it on uh, online. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time today and uh, wishing you all thank the best you. for your upcoming tour. I'll be waving from the audience for sure. <laughs> hey, we, we've got to get you tickets. Are you kidding? Uh, yeah. Let well, us know. We're, we'll hook you up. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thanks again for your time uh-huh. today. <laughs> thank you. Well, how cool was that? I have to say I was a little bit starstruck and uh, certainly enjoyed Uh, getting to understand just how many synergies there was, in fact, between how John approaches his teaching and how I like to uh, help other teachers with their teaching and how I teach in my studio. So that was really, really, really cool. Uh, I've been working to get John on the show for more than a year, so it was a real treat to finally meet him. And I have to say that if anyone listening has contacts with people who know anyone famous, (laughs) so any other famous contemporary pianist, do let me know. I've got on my list people like Philip Glass, Jean-Michel Jarre, Jan Tiersen, Ludovico Inaudi, and of course, the big ones, Billy Joel, Elton John. Uh, They're perhaps a little bit lofty in my goals, but you know, you never know. And I never know who quite is listening, who might know someone, who might know the right person. So if that is you and you do have a contact uh, to someone who you think would be really valuable to be interviewed, then please get in touch with us at support at timtopham.com. I'd really appreciate it. Now, I'm counting down to the release of my GarageBand course. Everything's recorded and we're about to start uploading it to the Inner Circle Academy. So if you'd like to get your hands on it early, then you can head to timtopham.com slash community today. And of course, all my members can log in and it's going to be there very, very soon, if not already. Uh, And for those of you who haven't got access to that, then stay tuned because not next week, but the one after, I'll be releasing a free webinar where you'll actually be able to see lots of this in action. And I guarantee you'll be able to get started with the basics of GarageBand in your studio from that webinar. Next week, we start on a three-part marketing slash branding series with one of the coolest dudes in music education today. He drinks Coke and wine at the same time. He plays drums. He has a big Santa Claus beard and even a few tattoos. And I guarantee he will make you rethink lots about your studio marketing and hopefully help you make some more money. We'll find out who I'm talking to next week. I'm Tim Topham and you're listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, have a great teaching day ahead. Ladies and gentlemen.
that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.